Greetings and welcome to Intermediate Algebra, Equations and Inequalities in One Variable, Lesson 2.3, Applications. When working with math problems, it's always nice to have a process to fall back on. So let's take a look at working with applications and what our process could be to help us through that. First, we want to read through the problem thoroughly. And we can either do it mentally and or on paper, figure out what we're given, what we know, and those things that we're looking for. Those are our unknowns. Now, the known could be more than what's in front of us. A known could be common knowledge. For example, they're not going to tell you that there are 24 hours in a day. That's common knowledge, and you should be able to know that the day consists of 24 hours. Second step is, let x or any variable be your unknown and translate the written information into math. Okay, that could just pull, be pulling out just the information, kind of getting aligned to what you need for math. The third step is reread your problem. Notoriously, we will overlook something when we read it the first time. So there could be some information that we uh, overlooked. Let's make sure that we have all the information that we're given and then some. Now you're going to write with the information you have that you translated over to math, write your equation that fits the problem. Then you're going to solve that equation. Once you find a solution, go back to the problem and answer it into a complete sentence and see if it makes sense. Many times we will get a couple of uh, solutions mathematically that contextually they don't make sense. For example, our answers might be 3 and negative 1. But does it make sense to have a negative 1 distance or a negative 1 time or uh, a negative 1 people? No, it doesn't make any sense to be a negative 1 or even a price to be a negative 1. Mathematically, that's okay to come up with the solution of a negative one, but you have to fit your solutions to the problem. And in reality, we don't have a negative people. We don't have a negative price, unless we're giving things away with money. Uh, we don't have negative distance, and we don't have negative time. We could have negative temperature. That's a valid something that could be negative. And then your last step is you want to check your solution of the problem as it is described. Go back, plug in your solution, the one that could be valid, and check to see, indeed, if it really was the solution. Let's apply all of six steps to this problem. The length of a rectangle is 3 inches less than twice the width. The perimeter is 45 inches. Find the measures of the length and width. Now, there are some common knowledge we need to have. Number one is we need to know the perimeters formula, P equals 2L plus 2W. In the problem, nowhere was this given. We also need to know what a rectangle looks like and that there is a length and a width. Those are all common knowledge. Now, what are we given? We are given the length of the rectangle is 3 inches less than twice the width. And we are given the perimeter is 45 inches. We know it's a rectangle. We know the length is 3 inches less than twice the width. We know the perimeter is 45 inches. And we know that P equals 2L plus 2W. The unknown is the width and the length, length measures. Let's let x equal our width. We could use w for width if you prefer, but I'm going to use x to make sure that that is our unknown. That is understood to be our unknown. Then our length, we need to translate what it means to be 3 less than 2 widths. That would be 2x minus 3. p is the 45. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now that we know what our P value is and our L value, we're going to plug it into P equals 2L plus 2W. 45 equals 2 times 
2x minus 3, that's what L is, and 2 times x, because x is the width. Now we have our equation. It has one variable we should be able to solve for x. After following your order of operations and your distributive property and your adding like terms, you get down to 45 equals 6x minus 6. Add 6 to both sides, you get 51 equals 6x. Divide each side by 6. x equals 85. 85. Oh, that's it, right? 8.5. Can't read my own writing. Sorry about that. 8.5. Now, we know what x is. x represented the width, so we did find the measure of the width. But we do have to figure out the length, the measure of the length. So let's play, plug in 8.5 back into 2x minus 3. That gives us 17 minus 3, which is 14. So our width is 8.5 inches, and our length is 14 inches. Now we can go back and check. We can check, plug it into the P equals 2L plus 2W, where P equals 45. So 45 equals 2 times 14 plus 2 times 8.5. That's going to give us 28 plus 17. And 28 plus 17 is 45. 45 equals 45. So we did find the correct solution. And again, we did have to look at the, the solution that we came up with. And does it make sense for the problem? Can a length be 8.5 inches? Yes, it can. So that is valid for the context as well. Now, occasionally in application problems, you'll get some information that mathematically, it just, we don't need it. For example, in April, bought, uh, Pat bought a Ford Mustang with a 5.0 liter engine. The total price, which includes the price of the used car plus the sales tax, was $17,481.75. If the sales tax rate was 7.25%, what was the price of the car? Well, here's what I mean about information that is irrelevant to the mathematics involved. In April, don't care. Pat bought a Ford Mustang with a 5.0 liter engine. Don't care. That is irrelevant to the mathematics of this problem. What is important, the total price, which includes the price of the car and the tax, the sales tax, was $17,481.75. If the sales tax rate was 7.25%, what is the price of the car? Those two values and understanding what those two values represent is the important part of the math. There is one common knowledge that isn't given in the problem, but we need to know. That is, how do you calculate tax? Well, we know, should be for common knowledge, that if we take the price of an object times the decimal version of the tax rate, that will give us the tax amount. That will give us the sales tax. So let's go through everything we know. The price with the tax, 17,481.75. Our tax rate is 7.25% or 0 0.0725. What is unknown is the price of the car. We know that the total price is made up of the price of the car and the sales tax. Here's where the common knowledge pops in. The sales tax, 0 0.725, times the price of the car is going to get us the sales tax. Add the car price, the sales tax, we get the total price. All right. X plus 0 0.725X equals the total price. Now, remember, there is a, an implied 1 in front of there. So 1 plus 0 0.725 is 1. 0 0.0725 x equals $17,481.75. Divide that by 1.0725 and we get x equals 16,300. So 16,300. The price of the car is in money. 
So our answer should be $16,300. To check our answer, we're going to plug in the car price is $16,300. The sales tax is $16,300 times our sales rate, or our tax rate. And that should equal our total price. 16,300 times 0.0725 is $1,181.75. Add the two values, uh, two amounts up, the car price and the tax, and you do get the $17,481.75. So we did our math correctly, and our answer makes sense. When you think about it, uh, if I got something like 6,000, means that it's over $10,000 worth of tax. That doesn't make sense. So there are things that you can do to get your intuition going to see to you before you check your answer to have that intuition of is it right or is it wrong? If this was $300 and now tax is $17,000, that would make absolutely no sense. So get some intuition going about your answers and that will help you out a lot in the process. I want to change gears just a little bit and jump over to geometry side of things. Now, when you have two rays coming off of the same point, the origin, that creates an angle in between these two rays. These are not lines because they're only going in one direction. We can also call these vectors, but uh, I'm going to call them rays. This angle in between them, generically, we call theta. Degrees come into play when we go all the way around a circle, one complete rotation, that equals 360 degrees. Well, so one degree is one 360th of a complete rotation around a circle. Well, at one point, just some historical background, it was believed that there were 360s in a day that the sun would rotate around the earth. And um, that's where we came up with 360, I believe. At least some of my research shows. If you go halfway around one half of a rotation, then it's 180 degrees. If you go one quarter of a rotation, that's 90 degrees. We also have nice terminology for some of our angles, our specific angles. A 90 degree angle will always have this little square in the corner may not be given that it is a right angle, or may not be given that it is 90 degrees, but it will be given this little square in the corner. That will signify that it is 90 degrees and a right angle. A straight line, well, is called a straight angle, and it is halfway around the circle, and therefore it is 180 degrees. If your angle is less than 90 degrees, then it is an acute angle. A-C-U-T-E, not A-cute, but acute angle. If the angle is larger than 90, but less than 180, then it is an obtuse angle. All right, those are all different types of angles that we work with. When we have a right angle, and that angle has been bisected with a ray, it creates two angles on each side of the ray. I'm just going to call these alpha, beta. You can call them A and B. You can call them X and Y. But because we cut a 90 degree angle in some form or fashion, that means those two complementary angles will add to 90. The complementary angles add to 90 degrees. Supplementary angles started with a straight angle, 180 degrees, and if we bisect a straight angle and create two angles out of it, and again, alpha and beta, if you add alpha and beta, they will add up to 180 degrees. There's a type of question that can come out of complementary or supplementary angles. Two complementary angles are such that one is twice as large as the other. Find the measures of the two angles. Now you're given they are complementary. This should become common knowledge. And when you see complementary angles, then you should know that X plus Y equals 90 or alpha plus beta equals 90. 
we also know that one angle is twice as large as the other. So let's, let's, since we're working with x's and y here, I'm just going to let x be 2y because it is twice as large as the other. Then we have x plus y equals 90. Let's substitute in for x and say 2y plus y equals 90. 3y equals 90, adding like terms. Let's divide each side by 3, and the measure of angle y is 30 degrees. Plugging that back into our original equation of x plus y equals 90, we will solve that for x equals 60. So our two measures of our angles are 30 and 60. And because our result, our solution, didn't mention x or y, it doesn't matter if x equals 30 or x equals 60. It's just the fact that we found those two measures of the angles. Math also is not only uh, building intuitive skills with numbers and solutions, it's also building your deductive skills with having information given to you, having to deduct what you know and what you don't know, deduce, I should say, deduce what's you know what you don't know, and try and deduce how that all fits together. So if we have two numbers, we can sum, we can draw some conclusions by the information that uh, we know their sum, their difference, their product, their quotient. So let's concentrate on just sum, adding. If we have two numbers whose sum is 50, one number is x, the other number has to be 50 minus x. Now that seems very obscure, and uh, so let's take it with a real number. If we know two numbers add up to 50, their sum is 50, and one number is 10, we know the other number is 50 minus 10, in other words, 40, because 40 plus 10 equals 50. It's just an algebraic way once we, when we don't know the other number, and we have a starting number of an x, we can figure out the other number. Let's try it again. 10, we have two numbers whose sum is 10, one number is y, the other number will be 10 minus y. Let's try it with an actual number. Let's say y is 2. Let's say it is 2. If two numbers whose sum is 10 and one number is 2, the other number must be 10 minus 2, in other words, 8, because 2 plus 8 is 10. If two numbers we have, their sum is 12 and one number is n, then the other number is going to be 12 minus n. Now that seems to not make sense right now, but there are lots of problems where we can use this fact or this type of setup to be able to solve our problem. So suppose a person wants to invest a total of $10,000 in two accounts. One account earns 5% annually, and the other earns 6% annually. If the total interest from both accounts in your year, at the end of the year, was $560, how much interest, or how much is invested in each account? Let's see what we know, and then figure out what we need to solve for. Well, we have a total investment of $10,000, and it is in two accounts. Oh, that sounds very similar to if we have two numbers whose sum is $10,000 and one is X. What is the other one? Well, $10,000 minus X. One of our account earns 5%. The other earns 6%. And the total interest from both accounts in a year is $560. I think we have everything we need to know to solve this. It doesn't seem like we have much, but we do. There is one, I'll just keep calling it common knowledge, uh, fact that we need to bring up to the forefront of our mind. And that is, how do we calculate interest? Interest is principal times in a rate. So Principal times rate will give us interest. P times R equals I. 
All right, so now that we have that, we do know we have X amount in 6% and 10,000 minus X in our 5% for our total of 10,000 of our investment. How we calculate each of this interest at the particular uh, account. So the 6% account is going to be the principal, which is X, times the interest rate, which is 0 0.06, so 0 0.06X. The 5% interest rate is calculated with the principal of 10,000 minus X times our interest rate at 0 0.05. So we get 0 0.05 times the quantity 10,000 minus X. We add these two values together and we get the total amount of interest made for the year. Now, I like to get rid of decimals, so I'm going to multiply each term by 100 because I have two decimals in the 0 0.06 and 0 0.05. So if I multiply each of my terms by 100, I'm going to get rid of the decimals. Okay. Getting rid of the decimals, I get 6x plus 5 times the quantity 10,000 minus x equals 56,000. Yeah, I know 56,000 is a big number, but it's a lot of zeros, so I think it will work out for us. Doing the distributive math, we have 6x plus 50,000 minus 5x equals 56,000. Adding like terms, I get x plus 50,000 equals 56,000. Attract your 50,000 from both sides. x equals 6,000. Now you do need to figure out what did x represent. x represented the investment at 6% six, 6 to figure out the investment at 5%, it's going to be 10,000 minus X. 10,000 minus 600 is 4,000. So at 5%, we invested 4,000. And at 6%, we invested 6,000. One more time, let's pop back to geometry and get a little bit of a breath of fresh air here. Let's talk about special triangles. And I'll talk about three special triangles right now. One is called an isosceles triangle. And what that means is that two sides of your triangle are the same length. Okay. So we have our sides of our triangle, A, B, and C. But A and B are equal to one another. On a side note, because you have two lengths of your triangle that are equal, these angles right here and right there will also be the same measure. Because you have two sides the same, you'll have two angles the same. An equilateral triangle means that all of the sides are equal. And if all of the sides are equal, all of the angles are equal, and since a triangle is 180 degrees around, or, or if you add the angles, you'll get 180 degrees. Well, 180 degrees divided by 3 is 60. So all of your angles of an equilateral triangle are 60 degrees. And keep in mind, equa meaning equal, lateral meaning sides, I'm going to guess, so that all the sides are equal. Another special triangle is a right triangle. That's where one of the angles, right there, is 90 degrees. And this is incredibly special because we have the Pythagorean theorem. So we can find the lengths of a triangle because we have the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. C is always the longest length. It is also called the hypotenuse. Okay, so let's put the Pythagorean theorem in play. The lengths of three sides of the right triangle are given by three consecutive integers. Find the lengths of the three sides. Well, it didn't sound like we were given much information, but we did. We got that it was a right triangle and that the sides are three consecutive integers. Now, 
let's think about three consecutive integers. Well, three consecutive integers could be 10, 11, 12. They could be 45, 46, 47. They could be 1, 2, 3. Well, they could also be something unknown like x. Well, if I went 10, 11, 12, from 10, how do I get to 11? Well, I added 1. From 10, how did I get to 12? I added 2. Well, the same thing with an unknown starting point. If I have three consecutive integers and they're unknown, it's going to be x, x plus 1, and x plus 2. Now, using the right triangle, we're always going to use Pythagorean theorem. That's kind of your go-to formula. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Three consecutive integers we figured out were x, x plus 1, and x plus 2. Now, x plus 2, no matter what x is, is going to be the largest number. In other words, the longest length of our triangle, which means this is the hypotenuse. This is C. Plugging in these values, and it doesn't matter if X is the A side or X is the B side. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you're going to plug it into A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So we get X squared plus X plus 1 squared equals X plus 2 squared. Now I'll let you do all this foiling out and reducing. I want to get down to this point right here. So we have x squared minus 2x plus 1 equals 4. We need to get everything to one side. This is a polynomial, and we do have lots of techniques to solve a polynomial, but we have to get it in standard form first. Okay, here we go. x squared minus 2x minus 3 equals 0. Let's factor the left-hand side. We get x minus 3 and x plus 1 equals 0. So let's do zero factor property and solve for each equation separately. x minus 3 equals 0. Adding 3 to both sides, you get x equals 3. x plus 1 equals 0. Subtract 1 from both sides, you get x equals minus 1. Now remember, we're looking for the lengths of a triangle. And if we're looking for the lengths of the triangle, it doesn't make sense to be negative. So mathematically, that answer was perfectly correct. Contextually, it doesn't fit the problem. So our answer must be x equals 3. And if x equals 3, then x plus 1 equals 4, and x plus 2 equals 5. So the legs of our triangles measure 3, 4, 5. And this 3, 4, 5 is actually called a Pythagorean triple. There are lots of them out there. Uh, 3, 5, 8 is another Pythagorean triple. I think 5, 12, 13 is also a Pythagorean triple. There's lots and lots of Pythagorean triples out there. Okay, let's consider that we don't always get a physical triangle to work with um, in terms of, uh, oh, here's a nice little triangle, work with it. No, in the real world, triangles do happen. We just have to kind of figure out, is it happening for our problem? Here's what I mean. Two boats leave from an island at the same port at the same time. One travels due north at the speed of 12 miles per hour. The other travels due west at the speed of 16 miles per hour. How long till the distance between them will be 60 miles? Okay. If I have a boat that travels due north, And I have a boat that travels due west. Uh, those are two legs of a triangle. Now, it's not an equilateral triangle. One boat is traveling faster than the other. But it will build this triangle. We want to know the hypotenuse is 60 miles. We want to know the time 
in which it takes it. You're like, wait a minute, uh, we're dealing with distance. Where did time come into play? Distance equals rate of speed times time. We know when the boat is traveling north, the distance north is going to be the 12 miles per hour times the time. Since they left at the boats at the same time, we'll just call this time. The boat traveling due west, its distance is 16 miles per hour times time. Well, Pythagorean theorem here, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Let's call a 12t and b 16t. And we know we're looking for the distance, which is our hypotenuse, c, as 60. Let's plug all that in and see what happens. 12t squared plus 16t squared plus 60 squared is going to be 144t squared plus 256t squared equals 3600. Combine like terms and you get 400t squared equals 3600. Divide each side by 400, you get t squared equals 9. Again, let's put it in standard form and factor it. t squared minus 9 equals 0, and we can factor it as t plus 3 and t minus 3 equals 0. When we break this apart in zero factor property and be able to solve each individual small factor, we're going to get t plus 3 equals 0, subtract 3, subtract 3, you get t equals negative 3. t minus 3 equals 0, you get t plus 3 equals, uh, or t, yeah, plus 3, plus 3, t equals 3. Keep in mind what we're solving for. We have two possible solutions. t equals negative 3 and t equals positive 3. Because it's time, time cannot be negative. Mathematically, that's fine. We can come up with a negative number, but contextually, it must be positive. So the boats will be 60 miles apart in three hours. Building tables, we want to provide, use our knowledge to build tables of paired data. Uh, equations and formulas that contain exactly two variables will produce pairs of numbers that we can use to build tables. Well, why would we want to build tables? Well, analyzing data visually is sometimes a lot easier than just staring at a whole bunch of numbers. So if we can form a visual representation of our data, we can sometimes find trends, we can forecast the future, we can uh, look historical to see what it was doing. But we're just really good at looking at things um, visually. So. Let's take an example. A piece of string is 12 inches long and is to be formed into a rectangle, aka perimeter. Build a table that gives us the length of the rectangle and if the width is 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 inches, and then find the area. All right, so we're going to use our knowledge of perimeter, our knowledge of area, to figure this out. I'm going to build a table, and it's going to have the widths, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, the lengths I have to calculate, the area I need to calculate. Well, the perimeter is 2L plus 2W. If I factor out the 2, that's 2 times L plus W. If I divide the 12 in half, I get 6. Okay, using that knowledge, if the width is 1, the length has got to be 6 minus 1, which is 5. If the length is 2, the width must be 6 minus 2, which is 4. If the width is 3, go through again, it's got to be, the length has got to be 3. If the width is 4, the length has got to be 2. And if the width is 5, the length has got to be 1. Using all of these combinations, 1, 5, 2, 4, 3, 3, 4, 2, and 5, 1, I'm going to calculate the area, which is the length times the width. Now, if you're not too sure where I got this 6, think about your perimeter formula. Factor out the 2. If the perimeter is 12, that's 12 equals 2 plus LW. Divide each side by 2. 6 must equal L plus W. 
that's where I got it. You might need to write it down to kind of put all the pieces together, but that's how I got the 54321. Okay, the area. 1 times 5 is 5. 2 times 4 is 8. 3 times 3 is 9. 4 times 2 is 8. And 5 times 1 is 5. Now, we can build a couple of tables. Length versus width. So as the length is 1, the length is 5. The width is 2, the length is 4. The width is 3, the length is 3. The width is 4, the length is 2. And the width is 5, the length is 1. It's a descending mm, partnership there. As the length grows longer, the width is going to get shorter and vice versa. The width versus area, well, the width is 1, so the area is 5. The width is 2, the area is 8. The width is 3, the area is 9. The width is 4, the area is 8. And the width is 5, the area is 5. Now we can see visually that when the width is 3, that also means the length is 3, that we have the most area. So if we were trying to maximize our area, we would want our width and length to be 3. If we were trying to minimize our area, we'd want either the width to be 1 or the width to be 5. That's it for this lecture. Until next time, be seeing you.